Good morning, everyone. A little, little late getting to the mic. It's enjoyed fellowshipping with everybody. How is everybody today? People still coming in? Welcome, everybody that's coming in. Glad to see y'all this morning. Everybody enjoying this pretty day? I'm sick of the rain. And those that I know work in construction and landscaping are sick of the rain. But hey, we need it, right? God don't do anything that uh, we're not need of or ready for, amen? Would you stand with us this morning? You guys are in for a treat today. What a wonderful, beautiful message this morning. Um, it will bless your heart and your soul. I promise you that. Yes. We come in here today, this morning, ready to worship. So I hope you did too. Uh, if, you, if you need a little touch from the Lord today, if you could use a little refreshing, could you just wave at me a little bit? Well, I know, I know this week uh, I needed it myself. So, uh, God, we love you today. We bless your name, Jesus. We thank you, God, that uh, you are greater than anything in this world. Lord, we're thankful that we can walk with you and talk with you. God, we thank you that you are doing things on our behalf that we don't even see you doing. We thank you for that, God. And I just pray this morning, God, that if there's anybody here in, in need of a blessing, Lord, they will receive it, God. So we just want to be, uh, we just want to worship you, and we just want to sing praises to you and thank you for how great and how awesome you are, God. Lord, we just praise your name and we love you, Jesus. Now, church, could you just say amen to that and just wave to your neighbor kind of across the aisle? Amen. There is a shaking, let hearts awaken. Our God is moving, forever changing us. There is a trembling, there is revival. The sound of worship, so great and glorious. Holy Spirit, hear us now. Breathe on us, holy fire fall. Come and fill this place with your presence. Like a rushing wind, send your spirit here. Breath of heaven, breathe on us. changing us there is a trembling there is revival the sound of worship so great and glorious holy spirit hear us now breathe on us holy fire fall come and fill this place with your presence like a rushing wind, send your spirit here, breath of heaven, breathe on us, breath of heaven, breathe on us. Lift up your hands and shout, the Lord is with us now, lift up your voice and sing, he is holy. Lift up your hands and shout, the Lord is with us now. Lift up your voice and sing, He is holy. Lift up your hands and shout, the Lord is with us now. Lift up your voice and sing, He is holy. Lift up your hands and shout, the Lord is with us now. Lift up your voice and sing, He is holy. Like a rushing wind, send your spirit here, breath of heaven, breathe on us, breath of heaven, breathe on us, come breathe on us, come breathe on us. Come breathe on us. Come breathe. 
say this morning they're thankful for the battles that the Lord has done for them in their lives I look in this house this morning and I see some people that I know who've walked through some valleys and God has welcomed that battle right there Miss Sherry this morning was on a ventilator for two weeks or a week and a half God was on her side amen I see people in here that I know have struggled in marriages but God is on their side and they're still together this morning I see people who lost everything they've had but God has given it back to them amen because God is still on their side if God be for us who can be against us this morning I don't know about you friend this morning but I'm thankful that I have a savior named Jesus Christ who will go before me <laughs> he can do all things amen but fail sing it Rachel you can do
on, sing it again, like the roar of. Like the roar of many waters, like the sound of rolling thunder. Hallelujah, give Him glory for the marriage of the Lamb is coming. Get ready, get ready, get ready for you. Get ready, get ready, get ready for you. What's your name, Jesus? Get ready, Lord. Break every chain, break every chain, break every 
could you just lift your hands right now and worship him if he's been good to you surely there's something you can just worship him right now about father we bless your name today father we love you we bless you jesus lord thank you for the chains that are breaking in this house lord thank you for the chains that you broke in my life god lord i bless your name today yes we worship you father yes bless you jesus I walked into a gun shop this week, asked about a particular weapon, looked at the at the man behind the counter, the owner of the store, and said, you know, what's does it recoil? Like what's the you know what's the range on it? What if I add a scope, will it be good to 1,200 yards? I ask questions about the weapon. And he says, I don't know, I've never shot a gun. I don't really believe in that. What would happen if I had gone to a doctor this week and she prescribed me medication and I said, now what's the side effects going to be? How fast will it, will it take effect? Will this, will, it, will this take care of my symptoms? I asked her questions about medications and she said, I don't know. I don't really take medicine. I wonder if the reason that so much of our country is bound is that the, the one body that's authorized in scripture to present the solution is not living in the freedom that they propose they have. A bound church is never going to be able to sell freedom to a dying nation. And so while we get all excited and we, we think about it, we talk about the chains breaking, we think about the chains over our nation, we Think about maybe even the chains over our church. What about my chains? Amen. What about your chains? And until we start walking the walk and talking the talk, then nobody's going to listen to what we say. Nobody wants to get medicine from a doctor who doesn't take medicine. Nobody wants to buy a weapon from a person who doesn't shoot the weapon. Right? There's a thousand analogies there. But if we're not the first partakers of what we propose to the, the salute as the solution to the world, we have no credibility. No credibility. So I just want to encourage you today. Be humble enough to listen to the Holy Spirit as He reveals your chains. Your chains. Do we, should we pray for the leaders of our nation? Yes. Should we pray over our nations? Yes. Should we repent for the sins of our nation? Yes. But before we do any of that, let's take care of this first. And I believe if we would have a revival of chain breaking in our lives, then we'd see the revival of chain breaking in our families and in our churches and in our communities and in our nation. We have to do first things first. First things first. So Lord, we just lift, I lift up John to you right now. And God, I humble myself and I'm honest enough to admit that I've got chains in my life. i got blind spots. i got closets that I've locked the doors to. Thinking that you'll just go on by and not look. But Lord, you already know God, I just pray right now that you would break every chain in my life. Every chain. Break them, Lord. And Lord, as a pastor of this church, I can't pray for any other church in this country, but for covenant life, God, you've placed me in this position for such a time as this. Lord, I pray over this church. Break every chain of bondage in covenant life in every member, in every home, in every ministry, in every service. Break our chains, Lord, so that we can demonstrate what freedom looks like. And Lord, we do pray for this community and for this nation. But God, let it start in us. And more specifically, God, let it start in me.
Ephesians 6 says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And it answers the implied question of why we should do that. He says, because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against spiritual powers. And so why is it that every time we have an issue, every time we have a problem, every time we run up against a brick wall, that we immediately sit down and start to plan and start to plot and start to think and start to try to figure out a way to get around it or through it or over it instead of wielding the one weapon that we've been given. And that's the spiritual weapons of the Word of God and praying in the Spirit. We don't have any physical enemies. We have no flesh and blood enemies. That's what the Word says. Do y'all believe that? Y'all act like this is the first time you've heard this. We don't have any for any flesh and blood enemies. So if you've got a problem in your marriage, your spouse is not your problem. If you've got a problem at work, your boss, your co-workers, that's not your problem. We don't have any flesh and blood enemies. We do have common enemies who are trying to divide us, who are trying to keep us bound, trying to keep our minds closed to the truth of the word. So I just want to encourage you today, be strong in the Lord and go to him first. He's the one that breaks the chains. You'll never plot your way out of a chain, but you can pray your way out of one. Amen. Everybody okay today? Listen, I want to invite you to pray with me about something. Um, goodness, I guess it's been a year and a half ago or so that we, I don't know, we, I lost 2020, so I don't know where, where all of this is now. But at some point in the recent past, we launched the Jericho Project. It's, 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 our, it's the issue that God's called us to, to help combat human trafficking, sex trafficking. And we launched the Jericho Project to use our property, our facility, including this, this property next door, to build a facility where women can be rehabilitated and housed. And then in 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, the Lord pivoted our vision and made it go a lot faster than we thought it was going to go. And so we're preparing rooms now where construction already began in the, in the, the Coley building, the education building, to be able to house women. Uh, in partnership with the House of Cherith in Atlanta. And so that's, that's in progress, and we're close. But listen, we were excited about it when we launched it. We prayed the Jericho prayer. Y'all remember, we prayed the, every letter of the name Jericho. We, we prayed something that started with that letter. And, and then the Lord started to move and started to answer those prayers and provide, and we started the construction. And, 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 I, and I, I probably, more than anybody, began to just think, okay, God, you got it done. Listen, it's not done. And we can't be slack in praying. And I want to invite you to pray with me again the Jericho prayer. And if we have it on the website, you can go and look at it. I'm, I'm going to do my best to share it this afternoon on our Facebook page so that everybody can pray it. But I just, I want to invite you to pray with me because we're, we're facing some obstacles. I told you last week about the, the uh, sprinkler head freeze and the water damage and, and, and all of that stuff. And, and listen, our problem is not the cold weather. Our problem, I know it's 75 outside today and we got the air on. But our problem is not the cold weather. Our problem is not heating and air. Our problem is not any of that. Our problem is that we have an enemy who does not want to see women healed and set free. We have an enemy who does not want to see a church get their hands involved in the kingdom of God. And so we have to fight the only way we can fight, and that's with prayer. So I, I want you to invite, I want to invite you to pray with me every day, the Jericho prayer in faith. It's not a formula, it's not a spell, it's not an incantation. It's just a way for us to come together in unity, praying the same thing over the same issue. And I believe that God is going to begin to open doors. He's going to begin to make a way. He's going to begin to, to give us favor, to give us a way forward and provide what the E says, every resource we need to move forward with this project. And so I just want to invite you to pray with me. Will you do that? Will y'all do that, please? Amen. Please. If you go to our website, covenantlifewestga.org, you can click on the Jericho Project and it'll take you to that site. Or you can go to the Jericho Project westga.org click on the Jericho prayer and it'll be right there it's real simple what six letters however you spell Jericho six letters seven letters and it won't take long but it's powerful if you pray it in faith believing that God's called us to this amen
right. Just a couple things to tell you. We're going to get in the Word. Um, Financial Peace University launches today here in the main sanctuary from 3 to 5. If you'd like to be a part of that, you can see Matt or Ashley Bridges. They are here somewhere. Oh, there they are. Yeah. You, if you're in person, you can uh, come see them. If you are virtual, welcome. Thank you for joining us online today. Um, you, can still, uh, you can still come in person. It's a much smaller group than a church service if you'd like to do that. Or if you'd like to talk to them about some way that you may be able to benefit virtually then you can let them know as well. But get in touch with us through a connection card, through text, email, however you can get in touch with us. We'll be happy to get you connected, okay? Um, we got lots of things. So tonight, Pastor Robbie, tonight is student ministry. Is that right? There he is. Hands. There he is. Uh, tonight's student ministry at 6 o'clock. So if, you're, if you have kids, grandkids from uh, grade 6 through grade 12, they are welcome to be a part of our student ministry. Uh, so come here at 6 o'clock. If, if you want to be in our grow groups, in any of the grow groups, tonight is women's ministry too, right? At 5 at Heather's house. So um, if you, again, if you need information, you can see Heather. You can ask any of the staff and we'll be happy to connect you for ladies meeting tonight. Um, if you want to be in the know about all of the groups, all of the events, everything that's going on, then please sign up for our church email address, our email uh, letter, newsletter that we send out every Monday. Um, and that's got all the events listed for the upcoming weeks and all the contact people that you need to get in touch with if you need to know something. So I told you when I did the State of the Church message that we were going to be working on care and communication, and we have plans that are beginning to develop. I'll be rolling those out in the coming weeks. Uh, but one of the main pieces for us inside is for us, if you want to know about what's going on, sign up for the email so that you get all of that in your inbox every week. Okay, if you have any questions about anything ever, you can let me know. Now, uh, this may be surprise you if you haven't looked at your calendar lately, but uh, four weeks from now is Easter. Four weeks is Easter. Last year, uh, in the midst of the pandemic, Easter was very, very different, right? We did a community service, drive-in service at the high school with First Baptist and whoever else showed up. It was, it, it was great. It was cool. It was the best we could do under the circumstances. But this year's going to be much more like a normal Easter service, and I'm really excited about that. Um, I, I know that there's spring break. Uh, Harrelson County is the week before. I think Bremen's the week after, and I, I'm not sure where Carrollton or Carrollton City, uh, Carroll County or Carrollton City is. Uh, but prioritize being in church with your family on Easter. Uh, and if that's online, then that's great. If that's in person, that's great too. We've got plenty of room. We're going to look at ways to be able to expand the capacity in person if we need to. Uh, but prioritize celebrating the resurrection with your family. Okay? And here's the other thing. Easter is the, is the one week of the year where people are more likely to come to church if they're invited to church. So who are you going to invite? Which of your unchurched friends are you going to invite to come to church with you? If you're watching at home, then invite people to come to your home and watch it with you. Or develop some sort of a watch party virtually so you can watch it together. If you're in person, who are you bringing with you? So just begin to think and pray about that. And I believe that the Lord will, will begin to soften the hearts of people and they'll come and get saved. They're going to hear the message of the gospel on Easter. And so that's, I want to invite you to invite people to come, okay? Now, one last thing. Uh, if you came today prepared to give tithes or offerings or in any way contribute financially, we've got multiple ways to give. If you're in person, we have giving boxes at each of the exits. Please, uh, please use those. Fill out a, a, an envelope and, uh, and use those giving boxes. But we also have electronic ways to give. So however you choose to give, if you choose, thank you so much for what you do. Thank you for your faithfulness, for your generosity. That allows us to do what it is God's called us collectively to do. All right. So listen, it's time to get into the Word today. And I'm really excited about this. So we began last month, uh, excuse me, at the beginning of the month, we began uh, a marriage series for the month of February. Uh, Pastor Robbie and Erica kicked off the series on February 7th. Um, I've taken the last couple of weeks and I've told you that today uh, we're going to have a very special guest uh, to, to finish us up. Batting cleanup today is Cindy and Raul Diaz. Uh, they, they, are, uh, they are very important people in my life. They're going to share a, a, about their testimony of, what, of, of the healing that God brought in their marriage. They're going to ground it in Scripture. And, and uh, you're going to enjoy what the Lord has for them to share with us today. 
Um, they came to Covenant Life about three months after I became the lead pastor. And so they've been here every step of the way through the ups and the downs, through the trials and the triumphs. Uh, from the very beginning, I remember the day I met them, it just... I just told Valerie, I said, this is a really cool couple right here. I just, I think God's got them here for a kingdom purpose. And to see what God's done uh, in their lives uh, in the last eight years has been truly a joy. Uh, Cindy has served in a lot of different capacities uh, in our church and currently serves as my executive assistant, trying to keep me on track, remember the things I said and where I'm supposed to be, and God help her <laughs> with all of that. Um, but, but they are a blessing to our church, and if you know them, then you already love them. But they're going to come and share their testimony and share in the Word today. So would you uh, put your hands together and welcome Cindy and Roland. Who here? Uh, no, that was very generous. And um, like he said, we've, we've been here since, I guess, 2013. Um, and it's been really easy to serve um, Pastor John and Miss Valerie. Um, we're really blessed, guys. We have uh, really transparent pastors who they just let us in on their journey. They let us in on their healing and their trials. And, and it really makes it easy to follow suit. So I just want to say thank you for the opportunity and thank you for um, not getting rid of me yet. There's still tomorrow, so I'll see how much I can mess this up for then. It's an exciting thing to get fired every Monday. Robbie knows every Monday. Um, but no, really, it's an honor to be here. God did some really amazing things in our life last year in the midst of a, of a pandemic. We had to slow down. We had no choice. We had to stay home. We had to just stop the normal. And God used that time to start drawing us closer to him, drawing us into a deeper relationship with him. So I'm really excited to tell you guys exactly what happened. Um, I do want to give you a background for our story just to help you understand exactly the greatness he did. So we were only 19 when we met. I know, I look young, um, I am. So we were 19 when we met. We just celebrated our 10th wedding anniversary this past year. That's right. You, yeah, he's clapping, okay. He's clapping, that's good. Uh, past. Um, it will be a milestone forever, 2020, for that. But really the milestone was the breakthrough we had. So we met at 19, we were working. Can you believe that? And we met at work. Typical love over the produce aisle there in Walmart. <laughs> Raul was new here. Did y'all hear me say his name? Raul was new here. That is not a Georgia native name, if you didn't know that. Um, he was moved up here from Miami. He's a Miami boy. And I was new to some things, too. I was working because I was a new mom. I was a new single mom. I graduated high school. And a few months after that, I was quickly engaged and then quickly married because, guess what, we quickly got pregnant. So then quickly married because when your dad's a minister, like, that's what you do. You get married right away. So we did that. We were in love. We were young. We were in love. So it was going to work out. It was God's plan all along. Otherwise, why would that happen, right? So a um, few months after having uh, Riley, I found myself divorced, a single mom trying to do this thing on my own, and so I had to get to work. Um, that marriage was really brief. It lasted just a few months, um, but much like a tornado, it started and it ended very quickly, and it left behind a whole lot of damage. The very best thing that came out of my marriage was my daughter Riley. I wouldn't change her for a single moment. I'd walk through every single minute of that again just to have her here. She has been the biggest blessing in my life, and she makes me have gray hair, and that's that. It didn't take long um, after we met for him to start falling in love with Riley, too. In fact, I kind of, like, shoved my kid on him because he was a male, which means he was bad, okay? I didn't trust any man at that point. They were all suspicious, they all had something to hide. They, they, he was here because I told him, I said, what are you running from? 
Like, you're up here from Miami. Who finds Bremen? What are you running from? Um, Nothing. He actually came to help his mom. Such a mama's boy. was so sweet. And I, so I I decided one day um, I wasn't at work. He was. And so I said, "Um, let me introduce him to my kid. So she's six months old. So I come in, and I have her on my hip, and I'm just shopping casually, like, oh, hey, how are you? This kid I never mentioned, look at her. And so he, he sees her, and the first thing he sees is, I don't know if you ever met Riley, but she has some gorgeous blue eyes. And that's not mommy brag, that's just facts. She has some gorgeous brown, uh, blue eyes. They're so pretty. They're, like, crystal clear. And so her little baby blue eyes got him. And so the minute he locked eyes with her, he was, he was it. It was it. So as I was falling in love with him, and he was falling in love with me, he was falling in love with her. And, of course, that made me fall in love with him more. It's just how that works out. Um, And so he immediately decided that since there was no father figure, and that was the decision that was made, not by my choice, that he decided that's him. He's going to be that dad. A 19-year-old boy decided to be a dad to a kid that he really didn't have to, but he really wanted to, and it's an amazing thing. And so I'm really proud to share that about him because that's, that's rare around here. It's rare in, in our generation to do that. So that was amazing. So I'm going to stick with this guy forever because who doesn't want to love the man that loves your kid? And so we were dating. It wasn't really very long, about a year and a half. He decided the very best thing to do for um, Riley and I to have a family was to join the Army. I hated that. I didn't, I don't know if I told him, but my face talks, so it probably did. I grew, ooh, getting all, getting all bubbly up here, all hummy. It's okay. Didn't mess me up. We're all good. So um, I grew up an army kid, so I didn't want that army lifestyle. Uh, I was an army brat. We moved around a lot, and I'm like, great. If I love this guy, then I have to commit to another army life. But I love that guy, so I committed to the Army life. And in fact, it was right after basic training, like right after basic training, the day after basic training, we got married at the side of of the road there in Rolla, Missouri, at a park. We were just in love. Who cared? Let's just do this thing. Um, So we got married in 2010, and then we got to have a really nice honeymoon We got to see the world and travel and go to really awesome places like Spain. No, that never happened. In fact, he was then wished off to his duty station immediately, um, and I had to go back home to Georgia. So we didn't have a honeymoon. It was really romantic. I loved every minute of it. (laughs) But it was awesome because then a few weeks later, we joined him in Texas, and there we were, a family, finally. I got my husband, I got the kid that loves him and loves her, and like, this is it, we're a happy family, and I'm really excited to start this journey. And then a few months later, he deploys. So there I am, alone, single mom life, but married, in a state I've never been in before, away from family, and got to do it all over again. It was a year of prayer for me. I learned a lot about prayer that year. I prayed really, really hard because all I wanted was for him to come back safe, and God was faithful. So he comes home from deployment. Finally, it's time to be a family. Um, We spent our very first wedding anniversary in two separate parts of the world, and we were ready to be this family. I was really excited that he was home. He was really excited he was home. So excited we had Nathan right after that. (laughs) The the one issue we did have was that um, he was in a war. And whether or not we want to admit it or like it, it changes things. Um, So he was never diagnosed with PTSD, but looking back, we pretty much see its ugly head rearing in our life. So he was very distant, um, disconnected, angry a lot, little things. We loved each other deeply. We loved challenges. That's probably the reason we're still married, is because we were going to get that endurance reward at the end of our marriage that everybody strives for. We were going to endure because we love each other and that was it. We fought a lot about, you know, the normal stuff, kids and money, the lack of money. We were never on the same page parenting. It was really a lot of good cop, bad cop, and I always had to position myself to be the good cop, just always did. And we fought about money, which... 
I mean, that's so rare, right? Like, nobody fights about money. Uh, we fought for the lack of money. And then when we finally got money, we never could really agree on how to spend it or what to do with it. So I did what I knew how, and I spitefully spent it. I deserved it. I did it. I retail therapied ourselves back into no money. Um, it, was, it was really good. You guys should join our you know, financial peace class today. We'll learn a lot about how that's not okay. Um, so that's just, that's just a little bit of just being real. And that's what I love about this church is that we can be real. Our stories can be real. This is nothing to glorify us in our marriage because we're human, but this is to glorify God. And, and the real moments of our life, there they are. You know, we were in the trenches. We spent a majority of our life in our marriage in survival mode, got married immediately, got into, you know, basic training and then deployment and then another child. But the really cool thing is I even almost forgot to mention that today, exactly today, eight years ago, Raul got to adopt Riley and she made her officially a Diaz. So he finally got to just finalize that Diaz on her eight years ago today to the date. That was insane when I saw that on my, you know how Facebook likes to remind you of all the sad stuff and happy stuff. That was a good moment. So today, eight years ago, Riley became an official Diaz, and it was amazing. It didn't change our, you know, marriage situation, but it really solidified some things and got to cut off continual hurt. So we felt like that was a really good move. It really protected Riley from having any hurt in the future, and even really ourselves. So I was really glad that was able to happen. Um, we thought that what we had was normal. So when we would have marriage series at church, we probably wouldn't even attend because, like, we're fine, okay? We're good. There's nothing wrong. This is normal. We have small kids. Everybody with small kids has the same problem, has the same issues. So there was really nothing we needed to learn. It's just awkward. And if I did think I wanted prayer for something, then I looked like our marriage is bad, so I wasn't going down. This wasn't happening. Um, so we kind of avoided these things. So if you're avoiding these things, I just called you out, and it's okay. It's okay. Thanks for viewing from home. It's all right. We're all in the same boat sometimes. We always do that. So what I really want to tell you, though, that that changed for us. You know, we, we lived our life a lot staring at each other through the scratches of our own lenses. John mentioned um, in his messages. And, and as jo um, Robbie mentioned in his, we were constantly giving each other our leftovers, uh, we didn't know there was anything to eat but leftovers. Like, was there anything else? In fact, because I was a mom first, that was my excuse. I was a mom before I was a wife, so you get what you get. My kids come first. So my, my plan was, I'm going to endure this thing until the kids at least graduate and they move away. And either two things were going to happen. I was going to just, I was going to leave and I was going to have a different relationship, or we were finally going to be able to live that retired lifestyle and have that friendship we really wanted, but I just had to endure until then. That was my mindset. I walked with the limp. We walked in our marriage with the limp, and we thought limp was normal. It really wasn't until 2020 that that changed. Before that, it was the heart attack series that the Holy Spirit just started prying at our hearts and saying, some things might be still broken. Some things might be attacking your heart. And I don't want you to live this way. I had no clue because I dealt with everything. Like, I was good. And Raul says it wasn't, nothing was important. Like, nothing mattered. Like, it wasn't a big deal. Nothing he went through was a big deal. Like, it, really, it just wasn't. And so he was good. So, check. I was good. Check. Until the heart attack series started prying, um, like Jesus likes to do. He's like, hey, this isn't right. I want to fix it. So I have never heard that therapy was okay for a Christian. Um, if you can't Jesus your way out of it, um, then there's something wrong with you spiritually. That's what I heard. That's what I believed. It really wasn't until we had some really transparent people share their story and say, it's okay. It's okay to go to therapy. It's okay. So I'm like, maybe it's okay. Maybe he's right. And so I knew that was my next step for inner healing was to go to a therapy, a therapist and start therapy. And that makes sense for me because I really like to figure things out. Like I want to know the root. I want to know why did I respond in a higher octave in that moment than I did previously before. Is that really the issue? I ask those really not annoying questions to my husband all the time. Really what's really going on? Let's pry this. Um, 
And of course, nothing. It's nothing, um, always. But still, I wanted to know. I wanted to know why my family struggled with a history of depression and anxiety. I wanted to know where that started from. Where did it start for me? I felt like maybe I was a late bloomer. You see, we have three kids now. We have Riley, Nathan, and Charlotte. Riley is 12, Nathan is eight, and Charlotte's three. And it really wasn't until Charlotte was born that anxiety started rearing its ugly head in my life. Never really thought I dealt with it before, never had an issue with it before, and then suddenly there it was. We had a pretty dramatic birth experience. Um, I downplayed it. It's not a big deal. Everybody has an emergency C-section. Like a lot of women have emergency C-sections. So what's your deal? You're fine. But it was really traumatic for me. You see, she had um, a prolapsed cord. The cord um, was above her head. So every time I would have a contraction, the cord would get clamped. And so every second was very detrimental to the oxygen going to her body. So I was whisked away. And I was so mad by that because I said, you know what, God, I'm going to do this natural. Like I had medicine and epidurals with my other two. I'm going to toughen it out with this last one because I'm tough. So let's do this. Well, because of that, I ended up having to go under for the um, C-section. So my baby girl was alive for two whole hours into this world before I ever got to meet her. And that bothered this mama. I didn't like that. I was like, why does he get to meet her first? I carried her for all that time. So it was a big deal. And I started seeing a trend of, of anxious thoughts. Um, I, I could only imagine the worst case scenarios possible when it came to my kids. If they were out of my line of sight, they just got kidnapped and they're dead in a ditch somewhere. If Raul was home late by like 3.5 seconds, he was also dead in a ditch somewhere. I couldn't keep the thoughts out of my mind. I couldn't wield them away. And then I just learned like, oh, well, your family has a history of this, so maybe you should learn to cope. So therapy helped me find my coping skills, helped me root some things out and help me cope. And that was really, really amazing. Um, John constantly talks about how we don't have a flesh enemy and that we have this thing called a spiritual warfare. And I was to the point where I didn't know if this was physical or if this was spiritual, but I knew that I just didn't want it anymore. And it was one day, I don't even know what the message was about, but I just felt like, all right, I, this is too much to carry. And I came down to the altar and I just laid it out and I said, I don't care if it's physical I don't care if it's psychological. I don't care if it's spiritual. I don't want it. And at that moment, I just felt like he said, well, you don't have to have it. And I didn't know what to do with it after that still, but he started leading and guiding me into this inner healing, into a season of inner healing. And it started with understanding and started with therapy. There's nothing wrong with therapy. It does not make you less spiritual. You can have a therapist in Jesus too. I don't have that t-shirt, but I would get one. Jesus will use anything he can to reveal the things he wants to heal in your life. And for me, self-awareness. The really annoying thing about self-awareness is that once you're aware, you can't unaware. Like, once you know something's not okay, I remember standing in front of, or sitting rather, in front of my therapist, and, and I didn't really know I was dealing with depression. I just thought every person goes through like low moments, and we're just, I'm just in a blah mode and a blah mentality. And so she gave me a paper and asked me, how many of these statements are true? And they were statements like, I don't feel motivated to get out of bed. Every time I try to do something, I know that I'm just going to fail. And so a majority of that list I answered as, yeah, I feel that way. And she says, honey, that's depression. And it was like a light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, that's what I've been dealing with? I thought this was normal, but it wasn't. And so when God revealed that it was indeed depression, that was the ugly head I was dealing with, he then led me through some revisiting my, my roots, revisiting some things um, of my past, mainly my, my first marriage. So you see, we walked down... The, our wedding day, if you're traditional. I don't even think I had a veil that day. We did have another wedding ceremony where I wore a veil for the family, but at that park, there was just no veil. But normally, traditionally, a bride will wear a veil down the aisle. And it's a really beautiful moment when the groom lifts the veil, reveals the, the bride's beauty. It's a really awesome moment. For me, my, my veil never got lifted. And when I say my veil, I mean the veils from the pain 
and the shame and the rejection that I was still wearing from my previous relationship, from my previous marriage. Those veils, they made me feel safe because in a way they were my wall. I did not let anything pass them. So they concealed me. They concealed my heart. I didn't even know I was wearing them most of the time. I thought blurred vision was normal, but that's exactly what veils do. They not only conceal you, but they blur your vision. So I'm looking at my groom, and I couldn't see him clearly. I'd look in the mirror, and I really couldn't see my reflection clearly. And when I had a relationship with God, I really couldn't see him clearly. But I thought what my view was was normal. I thought that was okay. I thought that's just how it is. So in 2020, I woke up one day, and I just had this desire to see about this spiritual retreat that I've heard about. Just see about it. And so it's COVID. Everything shut down, so it probably wasn't going to happen. Well, they weren't shut down. And in fact, they had an opening. So the question was, do you want to go? I don't even think I thought about it. I was just like, yes. And then I said, why did I say that? But I did. I said yes. It was more probably to do with the fact that it was a COVID quarantine shutdown and my kids had no school and they were home every single day and they wanted to play and be on video games and needed help to do everything. That was probably more of the motivation. A weekend away, yes, that's God. Let's do that. Um, so I committed and, we, and I went. Uh, I didn't really know anything about it. I just felt like I needed to go. I just needed to get out. Um, I got some really amazing advice and it was go in with an open mind and if there's, you know, sign up for the prayer rooms that they have. If you get a chance to sign up for a prayer room, do that. I'm like, cool, a prayer room. What's that? I don't know. So I get there and they're like, we have prayer rooms. Do you want to sign up? So I said, yeah, I'll do that. Still not understanding why I was there. I really didn't know. And not understanding what a prayer room was. Um, never heard of one before. I thought, well, are we just going to pray about stuff? Like, my grandma used to write down a lot to pray about. Do I need to bring my list? Like, I don't really know how this works. Um, I got met with some really amazing people who the very first part of the session was to teach you about the Holy Spirit. So I said, oh, snooze. I'm going to go to sleep now because I already know. I grew up in church. My dad's been a coastal minister my entire life. I know everything there is to know about the Holy Spirit, so I'm just going to, like, get through these moments to get to why I'm here, which is probably more about the prayer room, I'm guessing. They taught a lot of stuff that I've never heard before, things I never understood or read for myself before. I thought, what? The Holy Spirit is that? He's a person? I thought he was just, like, a power source. You know, like, like you just tap into it in prayer, and then he heals people, and that's cool. Or you have a prayer language, and then you speak it, and that's really cool. But he's a person, and I never knew that. I never really understood it. He was a person I could have a relationship with, like, every day, in my everyday life, not just at church. That was, like, mind-blowing for me. Like, what are you talking about? This is crazy. But it was all scriptural and in the word, and it was there. And I'm like, I, this is so clear. I love this. This is amazing. So maybe I did have some things to learn. Maybe I didn't need to check that box just yet. When I walked into my prayer room, it was finally my time. I got greeted with some really sweet people, and they asked me a really easy question, or so I thought. They said, so just tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? I'm like, easy. Easy. It's an easy start. Um, well, I'm a wife, and I'm a mother, and, oh, I work for the church, and I serve. Anybody catch what's wrong with that answer? That really wasn't the question, was it? Instead of telling them who I was, I started to list all the things that I did, my duties, my roles, all the ways I performed, all, all of my extracurriculars. That was my identity. So it kind of took me back because I was like, wow, I thought I knew who I was, and here I am not even given the right answer. So awkward. But while I was there, there was really nothing I knew. I didn't know why I was there. But when I was there, the Holy Spirit just came in, and he started revealing the same roots that the therapist helped me reveal. Like, I didn't tell them nothing. They didn't know anything. But suddenly, they knew. And so God revealed some things, and he healed some things. 
And I understood that forgiveness isn't just a decision, but it's a path to walk through. It was, it was a moment of releasing the people of my past. It reminds me of, of back in the Roman days, and I'll let the historic buff tell you all those details because I'm going to mess it up. But back in the historic days, we'll say that, when you would kill a person, the way they punished you was they would put the corpse on your back. And you had to wear that corpse. So if you killed a person, you wore that corpse and you dragged it around the city. And what happened is the toxins released from that dead body would seep into your bloodstream. And as you're walking, carrying this corpse, probably heavy, dead weight's pretty heavy, I'm assuming. It was heavy, but slowly it was killing you. So the poison would seep in from the dead person. And then you would then have your punishment of death by carrying it. And that's unforgiveness. When we're carrying it for so long, we build endurance. You know, it's like weight training. You, you learn to walk with it. But over time, the poison is seeping in, and it's killing you, and it's cutting you off from the things God has for you. And that's what I experienced in my prayer room. I walked out. I felt like 100 pounds lighter. It would have been really nice if I was at least like for real 20 pounds lighter in the real world, but I felt 100 pounds lighter. I felt different, and really I was. I really was different. The time in my room revealed that those veils I was wearing, they're kind of like all-inclusive, so I thought that my veils concealed me from being, you know, my veils concealed me from being hurt from my husband and, and being hurt by people and concealed me from ever letting people see the real pain, but really they blurred my vision from seeing the Father. You see, I really tried this Christian thing, and I really tried to incorporate Jesus into my life. But that's what it was, incorporating Jesus. So I did the formula, right? Y'all know the formula. If you pray enough, if you fast enough, if you read enough. So I, okay, it's 6 o'clock in the morning. It's devotion time. Oh, I didn't get some devotion time. Jesus, I know you're mad at me because I didn't do my Christian duty. And then I would have condemnation and shame. And then I wouldn't even want to get in the word because I'm already messed, I already messed up. I'm already, I'm starting the day off wrong. That was the formula for me, was just try harder. You know, you're probably just not serving enough. You should volunteer for, like, everything. Like, you have no ability or skill to do that. Do it because you're supposed to serve because that's the formula. He wants you to do these things. And so I did, not realizing that it was a performance evaluation of, of the way I thought God saw me. If I performed well, I'd receive his love. If I was a good wife, didn't kill him, he's healthy, I cooked for him sometimes. If I was a good mom, the kids he gave me, I did my very best, you know, nobody died, y'all welcome. Then I earned his love, and, I, and, and he was proud of me. I was in right standing. There I was righteous with the Father because of all of the things I did right except for that's religion. And religion says, keep trying. Keep working at it. But religion also says you'll never achieve it. So the more you try, the more you're going to fail, and the further you're going to get away from what God designed, and which is relationship. I didn't know God wanted a relationship with me very close. I thought all, he, all I was doing and who I was at that time was all he wanted. I didn't know there was anything different I didn't know there was more. I didn't know that he didn't care if I served ever. That it wasn't about work and it wasn't about my duty, but it was about me. That he just loved me. And that I could mess up every single moment of every single day and it wouldn't make him love me less. And I could do everything right every single day and it would never make him love me more. Because his love is always available, it's always abundant. It never changes. But I didn't see that because I had veils of unlove, of rejection, of pain. And I always wondered why it was so hard. I see people who were really seemed like they had this Jesus thing down packed. Why was it so hard? Why did it feel like it was such a struggle? And it was because I didn't see clearly. But during my weekend, it was really amazing. I felt the love of the Father in a way that I've never experienced before, never 
worked through, never could achieve on my own, and I did nothing to, to deserve it. I just was there. And he says, I want to. I love you. Here I am. And I didn't have to search for him or put in a formula to find him. I didn't have to go on a three-day fast and, and read the Bible in a year. I didn't have to do those things. He just came. He just wanted to be with me. He didn't want anything from me. He wasn't filling me up so I could then be used by God. He just wanted to fill me. He just wanted to be close to me. And so he came in like a mighty rushing wind that weekend, and he changed my entire belief system. He tore every single veil that prevented me from seeing his heart right there in that moment, and I could see clearly the love of the Father for the first time in my life. It was the best time. And I was like, ooh, I like this. I could feel the presence of the Lord so strong. I'm not even at church. That's crazy. I want this every single moment of every single day. I was hooked. I was like, yes, Jesus, yes, your presence, every moment, every day. So when I got back from my weekend, I gave mommy, mommy had a lunch break, okay? You kids are online, go learn. Mommy's going, <laughs> mommy's going to take a lunch break. I locked myself in my room. They took a nap. They watched TV. I don't know. It was quarantine and COVID time, so we barely parented. We did our best. But I locked myself in my room, and it was sometimes 30 minutes, and it was sometimes two hours because the time just flew. And I would just have my own praise and worship right there in my room. And I would just meditate on his word right there in my house. And his presence came in like a mighty rushing wind, and he tore every veil that was preventing him from being in my home. You see, that was huge for me because at my home was my, like, that's my lifestyle. Like, that's, I'm in the grind here. This is where I yell at my kids. This is where I complain to my husband. You don't really have room here. We're too busy. But that's not what he wanted. He wanted all of it. So I went from a lifestyle of trying to incorporate Jesus to being fully surrendered to Jesus. And it changed everything. So I get home, and I'm this super weirdo <laughs> to my husband. Um, he's like, Jesus is cool. Glad you got some healing. That looks really awesome. He didn't really understand because he didn't experience it. So he was just one of those like, it's cool, babe. Good, look at you. Good, 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 good for you. And in fact, one day, I don't know, I was, just in, I was just in my Jesus zone. I was in that secret place. The secret place that we, we must live as believers. The secret place with the Father. But it was in my home, and there was chaos around me. There was probably kids climbing on counters and dogs running around, but I was oblivious because I was just there. And he came home, and he's like, so that's awesome. But, um, honey, you're just, you're just like a little too much. You're just a little bit extra, a little too much. And at first I'm like, that's road. But I understood. I really did. The thing is when Jesus really, really comes into your heart, offense can't stay there. So it was really hard to be offended when you know that he didn't understand. Um, but he was hungry, and he wanted to know, what, what did she just experience? And can I get some of that? So I'm going to invite him up here to tell you, because he went back to a weekend just for him, and God did some really amazing things. So y'all help me welcome Roll to the stage. So after her weekend retreat, I definitely did see a change. And like she said, it, it was a little weird. Um, but it was a good weird. Um, I liked the change that I saw in her. <clears throat> there was a, a peace and a stress-free attitude about her. That amazed me, and it really intrigued me. Me personally, I had always tried to deal with things on my own. Things from my childhood, things from my deployment, things that had happened in my life. And at some point, I started fooling myself and thinking that I had dealt with these things and that everything's fine. You know, sometimes we like to downplay events that have happened in our lives so that we don't have to deal with them. I go as far as to think they didn't even happen. They don't exist. And so that's what I've always done. I downplay them, and I never talk about them again. My... Uh, favorite catchphrase was, it's not big of a deal. You know, that's what I would always say. And so I would move on, or so I thought. 
reality was I was still carrying it, and that stuff comes out one way or another. So my default emotion became anger. No matter what, I was angry. Sometimes I couldn't even explain it. But my weekend came, and at my weekend, um, I had a true encounter with the Holy Spirit. It took having that encounter with the Holy Spirit for me to start seeing everything differently, including my marriage. He removed all the veils that were blurring my vision. When I had this encounter, a lot of things that I had believed, certain belief systems that I grew up believing, were broken. So in the midst of this encounter, a transformation took place. I experienced God's love for me for the very first time, and it was the most wonderful thing I'd ever experienced. He took this hardened black heart that I had inside of me for so long, and he gave me a brand new one instantly. And it was one filled with his love, his peace, his patience, his joy, and his grace. I truly realized that no matter what had happened in my past, no matter what I had done, he loves me and all he wants is to be in close union with me. When I felt his love and was filled with his love, then I was able to radiate that love outwardly to Cindy and my kids. I had to allow God to reveal things in my life that needed healing, and I had to surrender them to him. And then after, we were able to come together as a strong union because we were both filled completely with the love of the Father. It took us walking through inner healing as individuals before we experienced inner healing in our marriage. And if you can't admit that you're broken, you'll never know what it is to be whole. And that was my experience. So he walked in the door. He didn't even say a word, but I looked at him and I said, whoa, you're different. There was so much joy radiating from him. I was like, free, recognize, free, baby. I love it. It was amazing. And then, like he said, the love that he poured out was so genuine. He didn't have to try. It was just oozing. I could get used to that. I even think I started calling him Raul 2.0. So he came back Raul 2.0. He was amazing. It was such a blessing for me to see him free from these things. We, we always view through the scratches of our own lenses, but my lenses would always magnify his scratches. I knew he was broken, but he ain't listening to me anyway, so I ain't telling him. So I just had to surrender him to, to the Lord and worry about me. And so then he went through, and to see what God did for him was amazing. And it really did transform our lives, our family, and our marriage. We were no longer a broken piece of each other, stabbing all of the broken pieces of each other. We were iron sharpening iron for the first time. For the very first time in our marriage in 10 years, we had a completely transparent and unveiled marriage. It wasn't until God healed everything that we were able to even share the things that we really were dealing with. We had no clue. We spent our whole marriage in survival mode up until that point. We were in the trenches. And at that moment, we were finally in the trenches together. We were finally on the same side. And it was amazing. In 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18, it says, But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the, and the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. When Jesus removed our veils, we finally could see clearly. We finally could. We could finally see ourselves clearly. The reflection in the mirror looked different. They, we looked different to each other. Even our kids looked different. We're like, y'all ain't even all that bad that we thought you were. 
we saw things differently. Jesus is the only one that can remove the veils. He's the only one that can tear them. We could not behavior modify them away. We love the Enneagram. We love learning our personalities and our love languages. Those were so helpful, and those were a lot of knowledge, but we had no idea how to use them because it was too much work. It was hard. And we couldn't behavior modify us into being a better couple, and we couldn't behavior modify our marriage into being in unity. It was only Jesus, the only one who can, that tore the veil. Let me show you in 2 Corinthians 3, 14. But in fact, their minds are hardened, for they had lost the ability to understand. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because it is only in Christ that it is removed. It is removed only in Christ. He's the only one that can change the way that you see things. He's the only one that can remove the pain that veils our lives. He's the only one that can restore unity in our marriages. I experienced such a depth of God's love. I never really ever knew he loved me. Not like that. You know, we always know that when we come to Christ, we're adopted into the family. And I think I share this with the ladies, that if I was in the family, I was more like the, you know, forgotten third cousin, brother's uncle, sister, aunt. I was distant. That if I was in the family, there was no way he called me daughter. I wasn't worthy of that. Because I didn't understand the love he had as my father. When I left my weekend, I was able to answer that question they asked me in my prayer room. Who are you? I am a daughter of the Most High God. I am his beloved. I am his delight. He doesn't just love me, but he delights to be with me. I am the joy that's set before him and always have been but I never knew it. Romans 8, 16. The Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us. As he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. Because I didn't know the Holy Spirit, really know the Holy Spirit as a person, as part of the Godhead, I never could experience the love of the Father because it is the Holy Spirit that makes his fatherhood real to us. And I really wanted it to be real. I didn't want to struggle with it anymore. I wanted to know who I was. I wanted to live in that place. And the Holy Spirit did that for me. He made God's fatherhood real really real. And see, the, the love of the Father is not like the love that we experience with each other in the world. His love is so much bigger. It's never ending. It's agape. It's huge. There was nothing I could do to ever, like, get his love to stop. There was nothing. If I walked off the stage right now and committed murder, guess what? He'd still love me. I'm not going to do that. Calm down. <laughs> but he wouldn't love me any less. He really wouldn't. Because it's not by what I've done. It's not by my past. It has nothing to do with my performance. It has nothing to do with how spiritual I am by fasting and praying and getting in this whole legalistic mindset of how God's supposed to be. That's not it. It has nothing to do with it. His love never stops chasing me. And I'm so glad that it didn't. And I'm so glad that it doesn't. When Roll and I got back together, we had a better understanding of who each other was because we had a better understanding of who Jesus was. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know yourself because you were created in his image. That is that self-awareness, unaware of self, because unaware of Jesus. Really, 
of who he is. We learn that when the Holy Spirit was invited to be a part of our marriage, we could have unity. And that he makes it so much easier. I don't have to remember Raul's personality type because the Holy Spirit reminds me. He's like, you know he doesn't operate that way. I don't have to try so hard to remember his love language. I just find myself speaking it because it's the Holy Spirit who helps me. In Ecclesiastes 4 and 12, it says, A person standing alone can be attacked, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better. For a triple braided cord is not easily broken. The Holy Spirit has to be braided in, not incorporated, but fused in a union with your spirit and that's what he wants and when he does come in and he's allowed to come in it's not just the marriage he makes better but all of your relationships get better so if you're already checked out because you're not married I have news for you that this applies to your everyday life every relationship you'll ever have will be in unity when you're in union with the Holy Spirit it doesn't even matter if they are because you are We experienced peace and unity in our marriage. We never fight anymore, ever. It doesn't happen. I'm kidding. <laughs> of course we fight. We're human. Um, but we're finding that because of the Holy Spirit, we recognize the real enemy a lot faster. Sometimes we just look at each other and say, what is going on? Your kids are crazy right now. Life doesn't make sense. And so finally... After we, it takes us a minute, we have a delayed response system sometimes, but when we finally get there, we realize this is the enemy, this is strife, this is an attack, this is not flesh and blood, and then we unite as sons and daughters of God, and we come against the enemy, and we take back that territory he tried to take, and it's amazing. John told us that the perfect marriage was Adam and Eve, because sin didn't enter into their marriage yet. And they had access to the tree of good of good and evil, knowledge of good and evil, that's the word, of knowledge of good and evil. And they were able to eat from the tree of life if they chose it. I really wanted to choose it. I really wanted to choose a tree of life marriage. I couldn't willpower myself to do it. Because my knowledge that I ate of the tree of knowledge was too strong. And I had like a CSI web diagram of all the things he's done. And the minute he did something, it would attach a line and there's a case. And for the next thing you know, we're talking about stuff he did 10 years ago. And there's no hope in, in ever resolving that. I ate from the tree of knowledge way too much. I couldn't choose the tree of life because the knowledge was too strong. I had a stronghold of knowledge. But Jesus tore it down. His Holy Spirit tore it down. And I realized that John's right. I know, Valerie, you have to write that down. John's right. It is the perfect marriage because sin didn't enter it. And I also found out that it was also the perfect marriage because it is the marriage where God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. It showed me that that was God's design all along. He has to be a part of it. He has to be that third person in the marriage. That's what he wants. And he makes it so much easier. I learned that what Robbie was saying about leaving my father and my mother and clinging to my husband and becoming one was only really possible if the Holy Spirit was the glue that fused us together. Now I know what it means to be one. I get it. I know what it means to love in a way I've never known I could love. One that didn't take a lot of effort. I want to tell you why. In John 15 and 9, 
It says, I love each of you with the same love that the Father loves me. You must continually let my love nourish your hearts. If you keep my commandments, you will live in my love, just how I have kept my Father's commandments. For I continually live nourished and empowered by his love. My purpose for telling you these things is so that the joy that I experience will fill your hearts with overflowing gladness. So this is my command. Love each other deeply as much as I have loved you. When Jesus gave Raul a new heart, he was able to love from the love of the Father. Because it is his love that we receive. And it is his love that we release. It just overflows. His love compels us to choose the tree of life. His love compels us to join as one. I didn't understand why the attack on my marriage was so strong. Why can't the devil just leave us alone? Just leave us alone. I couldn't understand it. But I understand it a little bit better now. You see, the devil attacks marriages so hard because if, if we really know who we are, if you as the bride really know that you're his daughter and you as the groom really know you're his son and then together you really know you're his children, if you really, really knew that, if the Holy Spirit really was the union that fused you guys together and lived in unity with you, that when you faced obstacles. When the enemy would rear his ugly head, he'd look and he'd see a representation of the Godhead. Three cord braided together. And that's powerful because where two or three are together in my name, I'm there. You can ask anything touching earth and it will be done. See, we are supposed to advance the kingdom. And how can we do that? How can we unite together to defeat the enemy in our life and in our families if we're too busy fighting each other. See, if, if you're too busy fighting each other, you cannot fight the real enemy. It's the devil. So ultimately, we learn three key things. One, until Jesus removes your veils, you cannot live in unity. And if we aren't in union with the Holy Spirit as individuals, and we're not in union in our marriage with the Holy Spirit, we cannot have unity. And it's not until we experience the overwhelming love of the Father that we're ever able to show properly love to each other, or really anybody. Now, you don't have to go on a spiritual retreat like we did. Jesus just knew we needed some time away during a shutdown. He's so faithful. You don't have to go on a spiritual retreat to find the same Holy Spirit we did. You don't have to even begin your inner healing journey by going away. You see, the Holy Spirit wants to heal the broken things in your heart. He wants to heal the broken things in your spouse's heart so we can stop stabbing each other and start sharpening each other as iron sharpens iron. Here at the church, we have a prayer team that would love to pray with you, help you start that journey. Ask God what your next step is. It doesn't have to be so dramatic and distant. It can be immediately. It can be now. I believe that everybody under the sound of my voice, the Holy Spirit's revealing a place in your heart a place that really isn't that big of a deal. One that you've dealt with. The one that you're, you're fine. One that if you just endure, you're going to get that endurance award at the end. There's a better way. You don't have to walk with the limp. If you're not married anymore, you don't have to limp into your next relationship. You can be free really free. So I just want to invite you to allow the Holy Spirit to really be in union with you, 
to really be an active, living, breathing part of your life. I invite you to allow the Holy Spirit to be that third person in your marriage, to be the glue that fuses you together as one. So when the enemy sees you, he sees defeat. He cannot win. There's not even a chance. And if you're the only one in your marriage today that feels led to inner healing because your spouse is fine, that's okay. Continue to walk towards healing because, yes, he wants it for you too, but he wants it for you. He wants you free. And when he says that, when he be lifted up, he says, when I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Stop waiting for your spouse to be on the same page. Go after God. Go after healing. And when you do, he's lifted up, and he will draw your spouse. I couldn't nag him to freedom or healing. It wouldn't have worked. This thing called spite would have made it go the opposite direction. I had to learn that. I had to learn that he believes and God lives in him. And so the same Holy Spirit that I have, he has. I learned that I am not that Holy Spirit. And I can't be. I invite you to break the lie that you've believed so long about yourself that you're never going to be enough. I invite you to break the lie, allow the Holy Spirit to just come in and break the lie that mediocre is normal in an American Christian marriage, but it's not. I invite you to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and rip apart every veil that has prevented you from his heart. I invite you to join the journey of inner healing through the wonderful spirit of Jesus because there is freedom. Wherever his spirit is, there is freedom. There is freedom today. You don't have to live like this. It will get better. You are worth healing. You are worth freedom. Even if your marriage has been strong, and it has been good, I invite you to still ask for more. Because he's a God of abundance, and he never runs out of more, more unity, more love. I just want to invite you to allow the Holy Spirit to be the person in your life that lets you see who you really are, your true identity. So you can answer the question, who are you? Thank you for your time. Would you stand with me, please? I hope that you've had a chance to listen to all the messages. If you haven't, please go back and do so. Because I think what you're going to see is that the Lord has used three different people, three different couples to weave together a tapestry of truth that will transform your marriage, not because it's from us, but because it's from his word. And I just want to encourage you to to do that, encourage you to, uh, to be dissatisfied. I think I said this at some point in the last few weeks, but I know that there's this concern for the divorce rate among Christian marriages I think I'm just as concerned about the misery index. It's not enough for us just to stay married, just to endure, just to get the medal at the end. Like, well, you hung in there for 40 years. Good job. We were miserable for 40 years. How did we glorify God in our marriage that way? God has better for us. He has better. He has, he has great. So don't stop. I, I pray for this holy discontent in our hearts to not be satisfied with just okay but to have everything that he has for us so listen this is this is the way I've, I sense that we should just end this service I want to pray a blessing over you and I want Cindy and, and Raul to come and Robbie if, if you can turn loose uh, from the live stream come on down if not I understand uh, but I just want us to, to to stand together and just pray over you because the 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 transformation in your, uh, in your marriage is not necessarily going to happen 
uh, right here, right now. It's going to happen on your way home. It's going to happen on Tuesday morning when you're all on each other's nerves. It's going to happen when you have to make those decisions about how you're going to move forward. And so we, I just want us to pray over you. You pray over yourselves and over each other. And we'll be dismissed together in just a moment. And if you have any questions, if you want any either, either of us to pray for you individually, then please come and ask us. We'd be, we'd be thrilled to be able to do that as well. Okay, but let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just pray right now, Lord, over every marriage, over every married couple, every engaged couple uh, in our church, everyone who may be watching today or listening. Uh, we just pray your blessing because we know that marriage was your idea. And Lord, we know that your in original intent was not that we just be committed despite our misery but, Lord, that we be united together as one, even, even as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to experience everything that you have for us. I pray a blessing on every, on every marriage in, that's, that's uh, connected to covenant life. Lord, every marriage is on the rocks, that's in trouble. I pray, God, that you would pull them back, that you would rescue that marriage. I pray, Lord, for every good marriage, that it would be great. For every great marriage, God, that it would just, they would continue to grow closer and closer to you. Because, Lord, we know the key to, to growth in our marriage, the key to intimacy in our marriage, the key to happiness and joy and contentment in our marriage is, is in our relationship with you through the Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that you continue to draw us. Lord, like, like Cindy challenged us today, Lord, don't let, help us not to wait on the other person, but that we work on us with you and we pray for them and trust them to you. And God, I just pray uh, your blessing. I pray healing. I pray, Lord, for humility. I pray, God, for unity in, in every marriage and in every heart. Lord, so that our marriages would bring you glory and would advance your kingdom as an example of... Uh, of the Godhead. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for what you're doing, for how you're changing us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.